Hi, I'm Mignon Fogarty. Here's a behind-the-scenes look at how I record the Grammar Girl podcast for those who like to have something to watch. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a segment about different types of fiction genres, another segment about fringe versus bangs, and a family story about daddy walking. Let's get started. Writers often struggle with how exactly to describe their stories to other people. They may get asked, what genre is your book? And they get stumped trying to give a pithy answer to encompass an entire universe and cast of characters they'd built up in their imaginations. Well, stories come in many different flavors, and some of those flavors are called genres. The publishing industry finds categorizing books by genre particularly useful, and publishers typically assign a genre to a book. It may be literary fiction, a mystery, space opera, or something else entirely. When you go into a bookstore, a library, or buy books online, books are also often organized by genre. You may also find it useful to figure out how to label your story this way. But first, let's talk about what genre actually means. When it comes to writing, the two common understandings of genre are often conflated. One definition of genre is that it's a writing format, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, play, graphic novel, comics, or screenplay. Genre, by this definition, doesn't take into account the actual content of the story, just how a piece of writing is structured. The other definition of genre goes beyond its composition. Merriam-Webster, in part, defines genre as, quote, characterized by a particular style, form, or content. Genre is a set of expectations of what the story may be about. Narrative elements that help define a genre include setting, is the story in today's world, in futuristic space, in 1930s France. Characters, are the characters realistic in the sense that they are people, animals, or things that could exist in our world? Are any of them magical? Are any of them supernatural? Tropes. Tropes are defined as common ideas, character types, or plot elements that occur in a given genre. For example, if your story has a spaceship, robots, or time travel, it just might be science fiction. And writing style. This is where genre as format and genre as content overlap. The writer's voice and the style of writing may also influence the book's genre. Think about the difference between the detective mysteries of Raymond Chandler, who wrote The Big Sleep, and the literary fiction of Joyce Carol Oates, who wrote We Were the Mulvaney's, for instance. Both writers have a very distinguished writing style, but Chandler's gritty and disillusioned noir voice helped define him as a mystery writer in a way that's dramatically different from Oates, who has a much more sparse and naturalistic voice. Generally, a writer's voice can shape the story's atmosphere to make the genre elements stand out. A fantasy may imitate the voice of medieval ballads or Victorian novels, for example, to highlight the impression we're not reading about our own world. Some writers refuse to give their books a genre, worried about creating a barrier that could limit its readership. Comics are for kids. Only women read romances. Nonfiction books are boring. But stereotyping the readers of genre is unfair, and we need to break down those assumptions. Instead, a book's genre should be considered a useful tool to help readers who love certain stories find them more easily. Here are some very basic definitions of common genre terms to get you started defining your story. Literary fiction is commonly understood to be fiction that doesn't contain any speculative elements. Sometimes literary books are also defined by their elevated style of writing. Contemporary fiction is set in our world and our time. If your book is set in our world, but in a different time, it may be considered a historical. If your book isn't literary or contemporary, it may be defined as speculative fiction. This is a more general term for any story that has a fantastical element. Next, we'll talk about some more specific genres that are filed under speculative fiction.
Science fiction incorporates a variety of fields in science and technology as part of its imaginative storytelling. Stories that contain impossible science, like time travel, or a science field that historically existed, like alchemy, can also count as science fiction. Fantasy is based on the idea of the fantastic. Wizards, magic systems, imaginary creatures, and myths and legends are all common elements in fantasy. Fantasy can take place in our world or in an entirely fictional universe. Horror is the darker side of fiction. It can draw from fantasy or contemporary elements. Vampires, werewolves, and other monsters can factor into horror, but so can serial killers, kidnappers, and dysfunctional families. Horror can be expansive in its content, but the main point is that it dwells on things that people fear. Mysteries, also known as detective stories, pose a central question as part of the plot that's resolved in the end. Mysteries can come in many forms, but people usually associate them with solving a murder, finding a missing person, or investigating a major problem. Genres can be broken down even further. Experimental fiction blends literary and non-literary writing styles. There are also subgenres. Space opera, for example, is science fiction that involves space travel, a large cast of characters, and political intrigue between different planets. Magical realism is usually a fantasy set in our world, but the magical elements are used very sparingly and the writing style is quite lyrical. There are many types of subgenres, but these should give you a taste to get started thinking about your novel or the kinds of novels you especially like. Finally, a book whose readers cross different age demographics is known as cross-genre. Young adult books that appeal to both teen and adult readers, for example, may be considered cross-genre. But cross-genre is a publishing industry term and not commonly used by writers or readers. You may see this word come up in various conversations about books between publishers, agents, and editors, though. Well, pinpointing your story's genre can be a tricky process. Understanding its use is pretty simple. Genre is only the tip of the iceberg in describing your story. But for readers, genre is one of many tools to help them find books they'll love. That segment was written by Diana M. Foe, who's a two-time Hugo-nominated editor at Tor Books and Tor.com Publishing. She's worked with genre fiction for almost a decade. Before we get to the next segment, just a quick reminder to check out my LinkedIn learning course, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. I'm getting a lot of great feedback about it, and it's a really fast way for you or your students to brush up on the most common ways I see that people can quickly improve their writing. Check it out at LinkedIn Learning or at lynda.com. Last week, I mentioned my bangs, which are called fringe in British English, and a friend on LinkedIn who's based in the UK, Chris Croft, asked why Americans call them bangs. And I have to admit, fringe makes more sense. According to Edam Online, the word fringe goes all the way back to the early 14th century and meant the same thing as it means today. Fringe is that decorative border material made of threads, and it looks a lot like the hair on my forehead. Around 1832, Americans started referring to horse tails cut straight across to look kind of like tassels as bang tails. And a few decades later, around 1878, we started using the word bangs to describe human hair that was cut straight across the forehead. It could come from the idea of a bang as an abrupt noise, kind of like how the hairstyle is a little abrupt, or it could come from the idea of the quick cut that takes off the horse's tail that bangs it off. That's what I found. I still can't tell you why Americans call them bangs instead of fringe, but that's the evolution of the word. And I can tell you that I never in my life heard it called fringe as an American until I became interested in language. And that last sentence brought up an interesting thing I hadn't noticed before. Bangs is plural, but fringe seems to be singular. I said Americans call them bangs, but I said I've never heard it called fringe. Interesting. 
The Oxford English Dictionary does have some examples from the 1800s in which they're called fringes. And in the U.S., we might say something like, my, that's a heavy bang. So I guess they both can be singular and plural, but we just commonly tend to use the words differently. That's English for you. Thanks for the question, Chris. Finally, I have a familect story from Emily. This is Mignon. This is Emily. I am calling from New Hampshire, just letting you know I love the podcast. I um, also have a familect for you. Um, so when I was little, uh, my parents were engaged in doing a lot of different um, like household landscaping um, activities. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time out there with them as a kid. And my mom would dig up a spot, put a shrub or whatever it was going in there. And then my dad would stomp down on the dirt to pack it down before they mulched. And uh, as a toddler, I always called that daddy walking. Um, and they still kind of use it today on occasion whenever they're doing um, landscaping projects. Just thought I'd share that one. Thank you. Love the podcast. Thanks, Emily. That's cute. If you want to share your family dialect story, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, leave a voicemail at 833214 girl like Emily did, and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks to my producer, Nathan Sems. That's all. Thanks for listening and watching. Bye!